reading and pronouncing Biblical Greek, historical pronunciation versus Erasmian. Hello, this is Philemon Phil Zachariou sharing with you some of my book's highlights. This presentation is an attempt to form a concise picture of some of this book's key findings, even at the risk of leaving out vital areas. The book consists of two main parts, authentic Greek sounds and the Erasmian influence. Part one shows that the phonemic sounds of mainstream modern Greek are not modern or new, but historical. And the modern Greek way of reading and pronouncing consonants, vowels, and vowel digraphs was established by or initiated within the classical Greek period. Part two shows that the effects of Erasmian on the Hellenic language and learning transcend, go far beyond the issue of pronunciation alone. Some names that will help us. Hellenic. Hellenic means Greek. Neo-Hellenic is the official name of today's modern Greek. Attic Greek the Hellenic of classical Athens. Hellenistic refers to the period 300 BC to AD 300. Kini, Kini, not Koine or Kune. Kini, common tongue. Biblical Greek refers to the Kini of the Septuagint and of the New Testament, HGP, historical Greek pronunciation, the historical Greek sounds that are preserved in mainstream Neo-Hellenic. The historical Hellenic periods are the Mycenaean from 1500 to 1200 BC, this period is associated particularly with the Linear B script, a pictorial type of writing. The Dark Age, 1200 or 1150 to 800 or 750 BC. This age produced very little in terms of writing. Then we have the Archaic or Epic Age from 800 to 500 BC, which is particularly associated with the Iliad and the Odyssey. The classical Greek period from 500 to 300 BC is particularly associated with the classical Greek literary masterpieces. The 900 year period from 300 BC to 600 AD is the post-classical period or the Kini period. Kini, of course, is associated with Biblical Greek, the Septuagint, and the New Testament. Within this period, we have the Hellenistic period, 300 BC to 300 AD. And then we come to the modern or Neo-Hellenic period from 600 AD to the present. The Byzantine period overlaps with the Kini and modern periods from 300 to 1500. And finally, the late Neo-Hellenic period from 1500 to the present. Now, these Hellenic periods are demarcated by historical events, not by any changes in pronunciation they simply show the continuity of the Greek language. Chapter 1 is on the development of Kini. Where does Kini come from?
Quigny did not come directly from the artistic literary attic used in the masterpieces of Sophocles, Plato, Aristotle, and others, but from the demotic attic, the vernacular spoken in Athens at that time, but whose literary level was deeply influenced by the artistic literary attic. Because we rely primarily on the written record to determine the pronunciation of Kini, it is important to understand the historicity of the Greek alphabet. So let's go back to the time the Greek alphabet was formed and ratified. We're talking about a new Attic alphabet, the Ionic alphabet. After the Persian Wars, 499 to 449 BC, the Athenians, having long realized that their old Attic writing system was deficient, began to borrow the Ionic alphabet, a 24-letter alphabet their kinsmen, the Ionians, had perfected. So 403 BC is a very important year. In 403 BC, Athens, under Archon Euclides, officially adopted the Ionic alphabet, which also became known as the post-Euclidean grammar or script. Here it is, 24 capital letters. It is thus from 403 BC onward that we can more confidently rely on the written evidence to track the sounds not only of Kini but also of Attic Greek. Some of the changes in the Attic alphabet involved vowels and vowel digraphs. Listed on the left side of this page are post-Euclidean vowels and vowel digraphs, and on the right side, the pre-Euclidean vowels and vowel digraphs. Look at line one. The four single letters and digraphs were all represented in the fifth century BC by a single letter, E, or Epsilon. Of course, the name Epsilon did not exist yet until some centuries later. Likewise, on line two, the three symbols or letters were represented in the fifth century BC by one symbol, O, Omicron. Again, Omicron as a name did not exist yet till Byzantine times. So how would an Athenian in the fifth century BC know the difference between what would have been in line one epsilon and the third symbol eta or line two the first one o or the third one u the answer is context these changes allowed for the distinction of grammatical forms here we have a linguistic phenomenon the 24-letter post-Euclidean alphabet and spelling are shared by classical Attic, Kini, and Neo-Hellenic. They have the same alphabet and spelling rules. From the 9th century on, we also have the lowercase letters, but again the alphabet is one and the same. Chapter 2 is on the phonology of Kini and its similarities to Neo-Hellenic. It is the longest chapter. Disputed phonological features. Listed below, you will see areas of Greek phonology that are disputed chiefly by Erasmians. This video briefly touches on a few of these areas. Here we have seven single consonants that are disputed, four single vowels, five so-called genuine diphthongs or vowel digraphs, three spurious diphthongs, 
three fricativized diphthongs, the so-called aspirate or rough breath mark, vowel quantity, this is about long and short vowels in verse, not in speech. Let us begin with Neo-Hellenic. There is a false assumption about modern Greek. Many scholars hold that the phenomenon of Iotacism, whereby certain Greek sounds merged into the Iota E sound, is true of modern Greek but not of Attic Greek. For there was no reason for the Athenians, a people of the subtlest intellect, to have assigned the same phonetic value to such a variety of E sound symbols. Yotacism includes the leveling of alpha, yota, and epsilon, and omega, and omicron. As it will be shown, this variety of spellings for the same sound is not a modern invention, but the result of a centuries-old linguistic progression that reached classical Athens. Yotacism can cause spelling errors. For the historical linguist, a blessing in disguise. The next few slides show what can be revealed about pronunciation when spelling errors result from confusing letters that stand for the same sound. Meanwhile, bear in mind that from 403 BC down to New Hellenic, as will be shown, Greek spelling rules are virtually the same. So what would you surmise if you saw misspelled words by speakers of Neo-Hellenic in which these letters were used interchangeably? And what would you surmise if you examined diachronically recurring misspellings in words from classical, Hellenistic, or Byzantine writings in which the same symbols were used interchangeably. To begin with, let us look at some spelling errors in Neo-Hellenic. On the left side of this page, you see a list of Neo-Hellenic words and their meaning and on the right side, you see the same words misspelled. Look now at the first two words. Fili. Fili. They sound alike. That means that Yota, Y, and Ita today are read the same way. E. If you saw these words misspelled in a text, you would have to figure out the meaning from the context, like ancient Greeks did. But what is an error in spelling? What defines error? Simple, the violation of a spelling rule. That is, grammar. A misspelling is a grammatical error. One A ends in a yota because grammatically it is a neuter gender noun, and one B ends in an ita because, grammatically, it is a feminine gender noun. Person not educated enough to know these rules is likely to misspell these words. Look now at 3A, B, C, and D. All four of these words sound alike. Meli. 3A is a neuter gender noun, and it ends in a yota. 3B is a verb, third person singular ending in epsilon yota, so is 3C but a different verb, and 3D the plural of a neuter gender noun ending in os. Notably, the above sample words are spelled and understood the same way 
in your Hellenic, in Kini, and in Attic. In other words, an orthographical error in these words today would have likewise been considered an error in Kini and in Attic, the cause for the error being one and the same, the confusion of different letters that stand for the same sound. Let us now go back in time to Byzantine times. Here we have a list of spelling errors in Byzantine New Testament manuscripts. Look at the nature of the interchange, number one for instance. Yota is used for Epsilon Yota because the two sound alike, E. Number two, Epsilon Yota is used for Ita because the two sound alike, E. Number three and number four and number five. Look at number five, Yota is used for Omicron Yota because they sound alike. Go to number seven. Ypsilon is used for Yota. Eight, Alpha Yota for Epsilon. Nine, Eta for Ypsilon and so on. All these types of error are the same as in your Hellenic. Let us go further back in time to New Testament and pre-New Testament times. The list of errors that you see here is no different from what we have already seen in Byzantine manuscripts and in your Hellenic. Yota is used for Epsilon Yota, Epsilon Yota is used for Yota, Ypsilon is used for Omicron Yota, and so on. Down to the bottom, Ypsilon is used for Yota. Once more, let's go further back in time to classical and pre-classical Attic. Interchange of E sound letters in the pre-classical and classical period. This table reflects the same type of errors that we saw earlier in pre-New Testament times, Byzantine times, and Neo-Hellenic. It may be argued that inscriptions tell us more about orthography than pronunciation. However, it must be underscored that the unbroken tradition of faulty readings emerging at the beginning of the inscriptional period about 600 BC and continuing through the classical Hellenistic, Byzantine, and Neo-Hellenic periods and judged throughout by the same standard, the same historical writing and spelling system is the best proof of the diachronic presence of the historical sounds and pronunciation of Greek. For the same interchange found in the Hellenistic papyri and Byzantine manuscripts are traced to classical times, practically all of which are mirrored in Neo-Hellenic. Here we have Plato's testimony regarding Iota E, Epsilon Iota E, Eta E. He is saying that in his time, people would spell a word three different ways. Now with a Yota, now with an Epsilon Yota, and now with an Eta. It does not mean that the word was pronounced three different ways. It simply means that those three symbols have the same sound. What we see in Plato's time is what we see presently in Neo-Hellenic. So actually, Plato's testimony confirms the pronunciation issue. Plato lived during the transition from the old Attic alphabet to the Ionic alphabet. So he was very familiar with the confusion that that 
transition created. Yotacism, therefore, is not a modern development, but is traceable all the way to Plato's day. Here we have an example of a misspelling in a decree inscribed in 399 BC, shortly after the introduction of the new Attic alphabet. The error here is the spelling of the letter omega in place of an omicron. What does that tell you as an example? That omega and omicron sounded alike. There's no difference in length or quality between the two letters, omega and omicron. The spelling mistakes etched in stone from the end of the 5th century BC provide the strongest proof of the phonemic pronunciation of Greek in the classical period. The same mistakes are repeated in the Hellenistic papyri and throughout the Byzantine period down to the present. This diachrony of recurring spelling errors is evidence that the historical sounds of Greek are preserved in the Hellenic. Spelling error versus alternative spelling. Often what appears to be a misspelling may in fact be an alternative spelling. In the next few slides we will see samples of that and the reason behind it. Alternative spelling is often subject to the phenomenon of Greek dimorphia, a two-level form of Greek traceable to classical Attic. One level is the informal level and the other one the formal. Alternative spelling of eta epsilon in certain New Testament verb forms shows no confusion of letters but formal versus informal usage. For example, emelin is formal, emelin, informal, ephristisan, formal, ephristisan, informal. In your Hellenic, inomenes polities tis americis, formal, for United States of America, enomenes phones, informal, for the same word united. The dimorphic nature of Greek is reflected also in the formal use of plosives p, t, k, versus the informal use of fricatives f, th, k, in the same words. By the way, the book challenges Sidney Allen's position that the modern Greek fricatives f, th, k, were not classical Attic sounds, but evolved from the Attic aspirated plosives p, t, k. Anyway, here we have some examples of formal versus informal use of these fricatives and stops. Formal epta versus informal efta. Octo, octo. Trefo, trefo. This dimorphic phenomenon is traceable diachronically from Neo Hellenic to classical Attic. Here's one example. Here we have two Athenian voting ostraca from 471 BC. On the left, you see the name Themistocles, spelled with a taf, t, and on the right, the same name Themistocles, spelled with a theta. Something can be said about the tenacity of the historical Greek sounds, especially these six fricative sounds. There is no hard evidence 
that the fricative phonemes phi, theta, he, beta, delta, gamma in Neo Hellenic were the plosive phonemes, as you see them here, in Aristotle's day. No one can explain, for that matter, when, where, or how six presumed Attic plosives were molded in sync into fricatives by New Testament times or thereabout throughout the immense empire. Yet, for a disproportionately much longer period, two millennia, each has remained fricative. The very longevity of these fricatives to date evinces the tenacious intrinsic properties with which they transitioned from classical Attic to Kini. Let us now look at one of the most disputed sounds, the so-called aspirate or rough breath mark. In his famed Vox Greca, Sidney Allen holds that the so-called aspirate in classical Attic was a phonemic consonant sound, but that its consonantal value dropped out of general use after the introduction of the Ionic alphabet in 403 BC. Contrary to Allen's claim, the aspirate in classical Attic prior to 403 BC was mute. It was a relic of the past. This is supported by many Attic inscriptions, two of which are shown below. This classical Attic decree shows that the word Erea, priestess in the dative singular, appears with the aspirate, and then again without the aspirate. Its presence or absence makes no difference in pronunciation. Here we have another decree from the 5th century BC. Highlighted in green are words that are aspirated, and in red, words that are not aspirated, but should have been aspirated. Also, the upper three green arrows point to the same aspirated word. The bottom green arrow points to exactly the same word, which is not aspirated this time. This erratic use or non-use of the aspirate in the classical period speaks of the fact that the presence or absence of the aspirate made no difference in pronunciation. This is a summary of chapter 2. The numbers in red show areas that were a little bit touched on in this video. But numbers 1 through 16 point out the many phonological areas that Kini and New Hellenic share. Now we go to chapter 3, the historical Greek pronunciation. History tells us that Plato was Aristotle's teacher. Aristotle was Alexander's teacher. Therefore, Alexander spoke classical Attic. Plato's or Aristotle's phonemic sounds were also Alexander's. These historical sounds at the threshold of the Hellenistic period are the progenitors of mainstream Greek sounds and may collectively be referred to as the historical Greek pronunciation. Alexander and Aristotle died within one year of each other. Look now at the commencement of the Septuagint translation in Kini, 285 BC. Notice that between, say, Aristotle's death in 322 BC and the commencement of the Septuagint translation is barely 40 years. 
Keep that in mind. Question 1. Given the fact that in 285 BC, the 72 Septuagint translators use the post-Euclidean writing and spelling system, the same as that used by Aristotle and Alexander, to translate Hebrew scriptures into Kini. How different were their Kini phonemic sounds from those of Aristotle or Alexander 40 years earlier? We are technically talking about classical Attic versus Kini. Question number two. Given the fact that the New Testament authors who quoted passages from the Septuagint, wrote as well in the same Kini and applied the same post-Euclidean writing and spelling system. What hard evidence is there, if any, that those New Testament authors read and pronounced the quoted Septuagint passages in a phonemically different Kini manner from that of the 72 translators back in 285 B.C. One more mention of the tenacity of the historical Greek pronunciation. Let's look at three language groups from among the Indo-European family of languages, namely Latin, Germanic, and Hellenic. What happened to Latin? It turned into French, Italian, Portuguese, and so on. Germanic turned into Danish, Dutch, English, and so on. Hellenic turned into Hellenic, Neo-Hellenic. In direct contrast to the fate of other Indo-European dialects, which grew farther and farther apart, the Hellenic dialects, Attic, Ionic, Doric, Aeolic, these are the main ones, under the predominance of Attic, have survived merged into one language whose continuity over the centuries down to Neo-Hellenic has curbed change to glacial slowness. Here is what some scholars say about Attic and Kini down to Neo-Hellenic. Modern Greek is closer to ancient Greek than is any other modern language to an ancient predecessor of even a few centuries. Ancient Greek is not a foreign language to the Greek of today, as Anglo-Saxon is to the modern Englishman. Few even among professional scholars today are aware how small the difference is between the Greek of the New Testament and a contemporary Athenian newspaper. Now we come to chapter 4, which is on the origins and nature of the Erasmian pronunciation. Let's look at the origins of Erasmian. Briefly, after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, many Byzantine scholars fled to Europe, bringing with them invaluable knowledge and treasured texts of Greek learning. In the early 1520s, three prominent scholars, one from Spain, one from France, and one from Italy, convinced Desiderius Erasmus, a learned and influential Dutch scholar, that the Byzantines mispronounced ancient Greek vowels and diphthongs, sacrificed vowel length to accent, used no aspiration, and failed to transliterate and pronounce certain Greek letters after their Latin counterparts. 
In 1528, Erasmus published a satire in Latin about Greek pronunciation in the form of a dialogue between a lion and a bear. As a result, this satire introduced throughout Europe a pronunciation system that is now commonly known as Erasmian. Erasmian inconsistencies. This table shows information gleaned from the pronunciation keys of 14 Erasmian authors. 14 letters pronounced 36 different ways. For example, Alpha is pronounced by one author A as in hat, by another author A as in hate, by another author A as in father, and by another author A as in cup, and so on. What some scholars say about the various Erasmian pronunciations of Kini. Several different systems of pronouncing the vowels and diphthongs are in use. The instructor's pronunciation should be imitated, no matter what that pronunciation might be. Hardly any of these pronunciations are even nearly right. I use an Erasmian system, freely acknowledging that it is not what Jesus and Paul sounded like when they spoke Greek. And now we come to chapter 5, which deals with a couple of Erasmian misconceptions about Neo-Hellenic. A typically Erasmian misconception about Neo-Hellenic is very well described by an Erasmian scholar. He says, the fact that certain diphthongs became monophthongs in the history of Greek creates a problem, that of the pronunciation of New Testament Greek. The pronunciation now used in modern Greece differs greatly from this and is much more difficult for English-speaking students. So the misconception is named difficulty difficulty for English-speaking students. In connection with the difficulty English-speaking students face in reading New Testament Greek the Neo-Hellenic way, here this chart shows that there are 20 Greek phonemes and 33 spelling variations that represent those phonemes. In other words, once the student becomes familiar with the sound each letter represents, he or she will be able to read Greek without any second guessing. Reading and pronouncing Greek is entirely consistent. This table reflects the same type of information as the previous table. It is simply given here for the sake of comparison. Think in terms of difficulty faced by a learner of English at the beginning level. That student has to learn 39 phonemic sounds and spell them 248 different ways. Now the list is not exhaustive. Look at the first two lines up on top. They show 30 different ways of spelling the E sound in English. Other sounds are spelled a dozen or more different ways. For the English-speaking seminarian, this is really second nature. But a learner of English, unlike a learner of Greek, has to memorize the pronunciation of virtually every single English word. What is the conclusion of all this? English-speaking students ought to feel superbly equipped to handle the less complex traditional Greek reading, writing, and pronouncing system. But that's not the point. The point is, the concern of difficulty in language learning is irrelevant. That is no basis for the instructor to apply anachronistic methods to facilitate the student, or more precisely, the instructor himself. 
come to chapter 6, Erasmian Latitudes. Let's start by looking at an oddity here, a pronunciation oddity. Erasmian scholars presume that in Hellenistic times, Greek underwent phonemic changes as a result of Alexander's spread of kini, with classical Greek and kini sounds becoming very different. Oddly enough, though, these same scholars pronounce classical Attic and kini alike. One then would hardly be amiss in assuming that Erasmian scholars consider Aristotle's pronunciation of classical Greek a more appropriate pronunciation system for New Testament Greek than Paul's own pronunciation of kini. But let us now get a bird's eye view of the transformation of the Greek vocalic system over the past 3,500 years and see how Erasmian fits as a pronunciation system for Classical Greek. From Mycenaean to Neo-Hellenic, scholars know today that the linear B script from 1500 to 1200 BC indicates that Mycenaean Greek had five vowels, E, E, A, O, U. Here they are. Compare them with the Neo-Hellenic vowels. They are identical. Bear this in mind. Keeping in mind the five Mycenaean and Neo-Hellenic vowels, let us see what a modern Erasmian scholar says about the pronunciation of Classical Greek. The pronunciation commonly used in American colleges and seminaries is an attempt to approximate that used by an Athenian during the Classical period in Greece, 5th and 4th centuries BC. This scholar's rendition of the classical Greek vocalic system is 10 long and short vowels and 8 diphthongs. Now, pondering over this phantasmagoric view of the Greek vocalic system, one may wonder if by 500 BC, the five Mycenaean Greek vowels evolved to such magnitude, how did their evolutionary process reverse itself and rather than continue to generate further changes as did all the Romance and Germanic dialects, it caused the original five Mycenaean vowels by New Testament times to reappear in their original state. And then, for twenty more whole centuries, it caused no further changes. The answer is as obvious as it is logical. From Mycenaean times to the present, Greek has always had a five-vowel phonemic system. Looking at this line of letters and sounds on this page. It means that the five Mycenaean vowels by classical times increased 360%. And then from classical Greek to Hellenistic or Neo-Hellenic times, there was a complete reversal of that increase. In other words, we started with five vowels in Mycenaean. Those vowels exploded by classical times and they became 18 vocalic sounds. Then the sound system imploded 
and it went back to its original state. Let's now look at Sidney Allen's Vox Greca. Sidney Allen says that classical Greek had 12 single vowel phonemes, 7 long vowels, and 5 short vowels. At the same time, it had 8 phonemic diphthongs. This 20 phoneme Attic Greek vocalic system reflects a 400% increase of the five phoneme Mycenaean vocalic system. The book critiques Allen's position on the Attic vowels in different sections in the book. Eta and Epsilon Yota, Eta and Yota and so on and other Attic sounds, the aspirate, and then those other sounds. And the book shows that Allen's pronunciation of classical Greek is indeed untenable. Chapter 7 talks about the Erasmian harm and the remedy. The Erasmian harm is the dichotomy of Greek. Early in the 1500s, the Erasmian acts of dichotomy was brought down into the heart of the Greek language and scholarship, thereby severing earlier Greek, classical and Hellenistic, from the later Greek, Byzantine and Neo-Hellenic. What is now at stake as a result is the meaning of the Greek texts, which needs to receive light exegetically not from the earlier Greek only, but also from the later history of the language. For a unity exists between the New Testament and Neo-Hellenic that should not be ignored or left unexplored. So, what is the Erasmian harm? With the Greek language dismembered and its sounds altered, it becomes quite difficult for those confined to the Erasmian side of the divider to conceptualize the extent to which the later Greek can shed light on the Greek text. And that encapsulates the horrendous damage the Erasmian acts abetted by the stance of leading modern Erasmuses today has succeeded in inflicting upon the Hellenic tongue and learning. Here's a comment by a scholar in regard to lexicography. A number of terms strongly associated with Christianity occur for the first time in the New Testament and continue in modern Greek usage with the same meanings. Furthermore, the nature of this connection is such that New Testament contains many features that have more affinity with modern Greek than classical Greek. Another scholar says, in connection with textual criticism and the light that can be received from the later Greek, goes this way, New Hellenic helps in the solution of text-critical issues, many of which are of an acoustic nature and are thus related to pronunciation, whereas the Erasmian system may lead to unforeseen negative consequences, particularly in the field of textual criticism. The last chapter is on pronunciation tips. Chapter 8 covers helpful points regarding the historical Greek pronunciation 
and further compares Greek and English phonologies. The appendixes analyze 10 classical Attic inscriptions in support of a number of pronunciation points discussed in the book. Here are our conclusions. No pronunciation system comes closer to the pronunciation of classical Attic than that of Kini. No pronunciation system comes closer to the pronunciation of the Kini of New Testament times and the Christian era than that of Neo Hellenic. Erasmian is disadvantageous to the study of the Greek language and literature. Thank you for viewing.